So let me introduce the two uh, speakers today. We have uh, Claire Vallet, uh, who is the operation scientist on the JUICE mission, of course. Uh, her background is in plasma physics. She did a uh, PhD in Toulouse, France, and then uh, went to work at uh, ESA ESTEC, uh, first with a cluster mission. Um, and then later she started to become involved in science operations uh, as part of the science operation center team for the uh, Rosetta mission. And she's now based in uh, at ISAC in Madrid, Spain. And in 2015, when JUICE was started to get built, she uh, joined the JUICE team. And she uh, has been working on developing the science planning for JUICE, which is now a uh, very important topic because we're actually going to get some science out of this machine. So uh, then we have Olivier Vitas, who is the JUICE project scientist. Uh, he started the same year working with JUICE as Claire in 2015. Um, before that, Olivier had different uh, positions in ESA. Uh, and I think Olivier and I met for the first time actually when he was the deputy project scientist for Huygens. And uh, he was also a deputy project scientist for Mars Express, for Venus Express. And uh, currently he is or now actually I'm not sure you are you are not a project scientist for exome exome no, mars trace not anymore, not anymore not anymore you were that for a bit yeah exactly so you have been going around the solar system and now it's uh, out to jupiter um and your research activities of course align with all this you're in the area of aeronomy and everything everything in the atmosphere above 80 kilometers altitude um so uh so I just uh, want to thank you as well very much for uh, being here and for presenting us with exciting updates about Jews. So I hand the floor to you and we will meet again at the questions. Okay, okay, perfect. So thank you for the for the introduction, Martin, and for the uh, organizing this with the colleagues from Europlanet, so Anita, Kalum, and, and other colleagues. Uh, it's always a pleasure to talk about, about Jews, of course. Uh, it's a great mission. And happy to be also part of this as part of Europlanet because uh, Anita rem um, remembers what happened um, in 2005 when we started the Europlanet and I was already part of this adventure. So happy to be here with you. So we are going to uh, to tell you what has happened uh, during the first year. So because we are going to celebrate in two days the first year anniversary of Juice in space, and we are going to update you about this uh, this mission. Uh, but first, the, the goal of this of this talk is really to inform you um, what has happened since the launch, but also to uh, to give you a little bit of flavor about the complexity of this uh, of this project, and also to tell you uh, all the activities we have been doing, uh, and because we are in the cruise phase, so uh, we can expect that such a phase it's a dormant phase or quiet. And we are going to show you, hopefully, that uh, you will see that it's not at all uh, an hibernating phase. Allumage Vulcan. Allumage 2 AP, décollage. So this is what happened uh, almost a year ago. There was one day of, uh, of delay. Due to the to to problem of uh, weather, uh, lightnings at the at the launch pad, uh, the launch was, uh, as you can imagine, a very intense moment for for everybody involved in the project and also the the scientific community. It it worked very well. On this image, of course, the the, the there were no people taking this uh, this uh, this video. Of course, uh, that was an automatic uh, camera from uh, from Ariane Espace. So we are quite happy about this launch. You could also see the uh, on the fairing. The drawing for the of the of the young lady who won the drawing competition. So that was also a, a very interesting uh, event in terms of of education. So this is what happened uh, one year ago. Uh, shortly after launch, we took a few selfies. We have some uh, monitoring camera to to that were developed and uh, embarked on the spacecraft to uh, to check the deployment of some of the hardware, in particular the solar panels, and also the some of the antennas. So you see here an examples of of selfies, uh, sorry. Here we see 
also the uh, the upper stage of uh, of the launcher, and there was the moon somewhere here. Um, so this is the deployment of the solar panels, the Rhyme antenna that Claire will be talking about a bit later. So this death was taken shortly after after launch. So to put things in context, uh, this kind of project, uh, similar to other uh, planetary projects, or when there is a mission to, to the outer solar system in particular, it's a very long project. So And the launch, uh, in fact, happens in the middle of the project. So wh when there is the launch, you have to think that uh, half of the job is done and we still have uh, 15 years to go. So for Jews, this is the, the rough timeline that uh, um, we uh, we we uh, we cut into four blocks of seven eight years. So everything started in two thousand seven when there was the call for mission from ESA. So the call for the scientific community to propose the best mission for a given budget. Juice was proposed uh, at that time. It was called Laplace. Um, it took five years uh, of studies, uh, discussions with inter inter international partner, and the member states and the and the. Um, and the laboratories in Europe, and also in in in, uh, in uh, international collaboration, to make this uh, this happening, the mission was selected in 2012. The payload one year later, and then when everything was in place uh, to start the development phase, it was in 2015. We started with the with the industrial consortium, and that was another block of eight years to to develop the instrument and the spacecraft to put everything together and to prepare the launch campaign. Everything went well uh, one year ago, as you have seen on the on the image. And now we start what we call the cruise phase, another eight block of eight years. It takes eight years to go to Jupiter because juice is very heavy. And then the final part will be 2031, 2037, something like that. That that will be the nominal mission, plus a possible mission extension if everything goes well, and a phase where we will make sure we archive all the all the data for the scientific community for, for many, many years to come. So as you can imagine, from uh, from uh, because of this long duration for the, for the project, there are important aspects to take into account. Uh, the the knowledge of uh, of everything related to the project from the beginning till the end, because it's not necessary. The same people who work from the project from the beginning till the end, people go retired. They leave they leave project, and there are always new people uh, to uh, who come on board. There are even some uh, some students at school that they still don't know that in a few years, they will analyze the, the juice data. So that's an important part of the project to uh, to, uh, to allow the, all the knowledge to be uh, to be kept uh, for the entire phase of the project. And given the lifetime, we need also to be very patient. So that's part of the of an important topics uh, item of the planetary mission. In terms of science, uh, since we don't go to Jupiter every uh, Every year, once we develop a mission to, uh, to to for this target, we try to build a mission with the uh, biggest, the largest possible science and interdisciplinary if possible. And the focus of JUICE is really the the icy moons of Jupiter, so Ganymede, Europa, and Callisto, with a prime focus on on Ganymede. This is our prime target for the mission, and we are very interested to understand whether there are some habitable places inside those moons around the planet, like uh, like Jupiter. And in particular, we are going to study the liquid water ocean, which are underneath the crust of those uh, icy moons. But we don't uh, we 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 don't want to study those moons in isolation to understand all their their properties. We need to study the Jupiter system uh, globally. So that's why we are going also to explore the Jupiter atmosphere, the the, the magnetosphere all the other satellites, including IO, the ring system, the dust, and all these complex interaction between all these bodies. So there are two kinds of, of, of interaction of couplings. One is electromagnetic. So the, some particles follow the electromagnetic field lines from the moons to, to Jupiter and vice versa. And there is also some gravitational coupling due to the, to the big planet in the center, and also between the moons themselves and one uh, consequences are the tides uh, inside the moon, which are responsible for uh, for the presence of liquid water. So, as you can see a little bit from from this short description, the the system is very complex, and the science of juice covers a, a, a really a broad uh, area of of domains. In terms of couplings, just one illustration: they are, these are the aurora rays, so the electromagnetic couplings. It's the via the magnetic field line in the Jupiter system and between Jupiter and the moons. And sometimes we see an illustration of that because for this array, as imaged by Hubble, you see a little spot here. 
uh, on the south part of this array, which in fact is due to one of the moon of Jupiter. I think in that case, it, it's Io. So this invisible link uh, between the moons and the planets sometimes become uh, visible into, into bracket, of course. But JUICE is not only a, a pure planetary mission because Jupiter with uh, um, uh, this giant planet and all those moons which form a, a, a miniaturized uh, smaller system, it's an interesting model for exoplanet system. So stu studying uh, the Jupiter system with JUICE will also, will also allow to make some interesting connection with the exoplanet system. And some processes we are going to explore like magnetic field, the interaction between the magnetic field of Jupiter, the magnetic field of Ganymede, will be also interesting to connect with some uh, um, conditions in, in other uh, systems outside uh, uh, the solar system. So it's uh, not a pure planetary mission, but also a link with, uh, with exoplanet, which makes the mission also quite interesting. In terms of trajectory, so I will go quickly for the first part, because we are going to explain what happened. Uh, So JUICE cannot go directly to Jupiter because the spacecraft is too heavy, more than six tons. So we need to uh, do what we call the planetary flybys to, uh, to gain some speed and energy to be able to reach Jupiter. And this is what JUICE will be doing with four flybys. So the first one will occur at uh, Earth and Moon in a few months. And then there will be two other uh, Earth flyby. You see an example here and the Venus flyby that uh, you have seen maybe at the beginning of, the, of this movie. At some point, we will cross here the asteroid belt beyond Mars orbit. And we will go for the final um, uh, flyby of the Earth in 2029, so the final bye-bye. Every time we do a flyby, we take images, we, we take a little bit of data for the calibration. We'll be talking about that a bit later. And then once we have done this final flyby, we are en route to Jupiter. We go through the asteroid belt. We will be talking about asteroid a little bit later. And we arrive at Jupiter in 2031. And one interesting aspect is that before uh, inserting into Jupiter, we are going to make a close flyby of Ganymede. Uh, this time it's a gravity assist flyby to help decelerating the spacecraft and to save, to save some fuel for the orbit insertion, which costs a lot of fuel uh, for the spacecraft. Once we are in the system, we will be mainly in the equatorial plane to study the, the three icy moons of Jupiter. So there will be a series of flybys for, for three years, two at uh, Europa, uh, more than 20 at Callisto, and something like 12, 13 at, uh, at Ganymede. So every flyby will bring a lot of science. At some point, we'll be using the, the Callisto flyby to, uh, to, uh, to escape uh, the, the plane of the, the equatorial plane of Jupiter. So this is a Europa flyby. So we will have two of them, only two because of the radiation environment. So here it's a 400 kilometer flyby. So for this flyby, we'll switch on all the instruments together. And for 24 hours, it will be one of the most intense phase of the mission. And it will take a few months to download the data. Here it's an example of Callisto flyby. So I will, I will accelerate for the, for the sake of time. At some point, we'll escape the, the equatorial plane of Jupiter, which is called the high latitude phase to observe Jupiter from, from above, in particular interesting for the, for the poles of Jupiter and the magnetosphere. And in the end, we'll orbit uh, Ganymede, so that'll be the second orbit insertion of the mission after Jupiter. And we'll be orbiting Ganymede for a few months. There will be a series of elliptical orbits, high altitude orbit at different altitudes, and we will even reach a very low altitude orbit at 200 kilometers. And at the end of the mission, uh, once we cannot control the spacecraft, there will be an impact uh, crash on Ganymede. Court control or not control, we'll see uh, what is the status of the mission in 2034-35. So a little bit about the, the, the spacecraft. So you see how the spacecraft look like, huge solar panels uh, because of the we are far far from the sun, so 85 square meters. So you see the side, the, the shape of the spacecraft, six, six ton, uh, 10, 10 instrument, many, many antennas and boom. So this is a, a, a magnetometer boom uh, 10 meter long to allow the, the, the magnetic sensors to be as far as possible from the spacecraft to avoid disturbances. We have the radar antenna here, uh, which uh, gave us some some headache at, uh, shortly after launch. 
all the remote sensing instruments there on this on this side. We have four remote sensing instruments. We have in total three geophysics instruments and three in situ particle instruments to measure all particles, electron, neutron, proton, uh, ions, and also waves and electric field. Uh, we have here some some booms from the wave instrument, four booms which we call Langmuir probe. And we have some radio science experiment to to measure the gravity field of the of the moons and also doing some some occultation. And in addition, we will be also using the communication system of the spacecraft to uh, to uh, to listen to the radio signal from an array of radio telescopes to pinpoint much better the position of the spacecraft for for geophysics uh, applications. So you see a very complete payload. I'm not going into the detail here because of, of lack of time, but it's a very comprehensive payload to really uh, address all the science topic of JUICE. So we go quickly through the payload. Um, here, that was the, the I've shown you the, the real spacecraft, but we have also a second spacecraft, which we call engineering model. And the model arrived at ESOC uh, uh, just a few weeks ago. So that's a one-to-one -one copy of the of the of the spacecraft, which uh, will allow to test some uh, very important sequence before uh, injecting the sequence into the real spacecraft. So here it's a uh, we see the Ignacio Tenko, our colleague from ESOC, the spacecraft operation manager, who welcomed the the engineering model a few a few days ago. You see here one of the star trackers, some instrument here. And here, this is what we call the vault, where all the sensitive electronics is uh, positioned to, um, to be protected from the harsh radiation environment. In terms of elements, so we have the spacecraft, the rocket. We'll be using the, the, the ESA um, radio telescopes to ground stations to, to download the data and to communicate with the, with the spacecraft. We have three, we have three uh, stations uh, that we'll be using on different continents. Our operation center is located in ESOC in Darmstadt. They will control the spacecraft, make sure everything is okay in terms of uh, safety, navigation, commanding, downlocking. And then the ISAC in Spain, a center on, uh, for which um, uh, Claire is working in. Uh, they, will, they, will, they are in charge of the planning of the instrument in particular and of the archive. And everything we do is to give the best uh, data set later to the scientific community from the ISAC center through the Planetary Science Archive. So now a short movie to show you what has happened uh, since uh, launch. So we launched one year ago, and you can see here the Earth, the spacecraft trajectory. So the beginning was slightly beyond the Earth's orbit, and then it moved uh, towards the Sun. I think we reached something like 0 0.85 astronomical units. Uh, as I mentioned, we cannot go directly to Jupiter, so we need to, uh, to orbit a few times the Sun to, uh, to make some planetary flybys and to get uh, additional uh, energy and speed to be able to reach to Jupiter. So, during this first year, in fact, JUICE was more or less following uh, uh, the Earth, and we'll meet again uh, Earth and the Moon in a few months. This is what is illustrated here. So there will be a, a Moon flyby in in the 19th of August. So coming from the night side to the to the day side, the flyby altitude of 700 kilometers, and one day later we'll fly by the Earth at much higher altitude. Uh, the uh, you see the JUICE spacecraft is the field of view of some instrument because we have been working in the last few weeks to uh, uh, to prepare the timeline of the instrument operation during this uh, this uh, these two flyby because it's always interesting to operate the instrument in a known environment mm -hmm. for calibration also to take some images to see if the instrument works well and to do a bit of science if if possible. And here I will hand over to uh, to Claire for the next part of the of the of the talk. Yeah, thanks, Olivier. Uh, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so I'm going into more details about what what we have uh, done or what the spacecraft and the teams have been doing since uh, one year and in the coming months. Uh, so from the perspective of the spacecraft, but also from the, the perspective on the, of the science planning and operations team, and also from the point of view of the science working team, the, the team of, uh, uh, of persons that are actually taking the scientific decision for the mission. Um, next slide, please. So we started with uh, actually three months of commissioning uh, of the of the entire uh, spacecraft, so uh, including uh, all payload. 
And uh, what was up to now, I think the most um, nerves wracking um, event was the problem with the deployment of the um, ice penetrating radar antenna. So as, as uh, Olivier shown at the beginning, when we launched the, the, the antenna is in a folded position. So it's uh, two, two, uh, in two parts and of each uh, part uh, with four segments. And uh, so we started the, the deployment uh, on the mid-April and after the first successful deployment that we could check with the monitoring camera, uh, the second uh, part got stuck um, and couldn't deploy. So there were many, uh, many uh, discussions, uh, uh, both from the industry, the, uh, the, 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 the instrument teams, the operations teams and the, the project teams, to understand what was going on and how, how we could uh, solve the problem. Uh, there were several attempts to uh, first warm up the side of the spacecraft where the, the antenna was uh, was actually located to try to maybe remove uh, potential ice that could have uh, uh, prevented the holding pin to actually get removed. Um, there were also an attempt to shake softly, of course, but shake a little bit the spacecraft, both using the thrusters and the main engine. And at the end on ground, they were uh, able to reproduce the problem. And uh, the solution was to uh, try to uh, activate a non-explosive actuator that was located uh, nearby and that could create this kind of small uh, shock that could uh, free the antenna. And this was a few weeks after, I think it was the something like the 12th of May, so more than three weeks later, then uh, we got the relief to see uh, still use, uh, through the, uh, the the monitoring camera that the the, the antenna actually properly uh, deployed. So that was really the very stressful part of the of the commissioning. Next slide, please. So the rest overall went very smoothly. We had, uh, especially from the payload point of view, uh, we had a very nice result. Uh, here the, I've put some illustration from the magnetometer where you can see the magnetic field measured from the two uh, flux gate magnetometer before, before and after deployment. There were also some uh, nice thrusts from the UV spectrograph uh, that showed the UV bright stars of the Milky Way. And we have the breaking. We had the breaking news from the semi-millimeter wave instrument that actually discovered that we have water on Earth, which was uh, quite reassuring, but also from the instrument's point of view. So the the commissioning ended uh, mid uh, mid July, and uh, from August onward, we also switched on the juice radiation monitor. So this is um, uh, an instrument which is not part of the scientific payload, but which is actually um, uh, designed to uh, cope with the very harsh uh, radiation environment at Jupiter, but which is also extremely useful during the cruise phase to, to actually monitor uh, the sun activities uh, through the journey of, of juice. And uh, one illustration here happened the beginning of February, where uh, the, the radiation monitor registered a very high flux of high energy particles. Uh, and it turned out that it was um, linked to a solar flare uh, uh, and accompanied with um, a coronal mass ejection, which was actually very close magnetically from, from, uh, from where JUICE was located. Um, one big event from both the operations team, but also from, for, from the spacecraft, was, was the, the deep space maneuver that took place last year in November. So actually, we use the gravity assist, as, as Olivier was mentioning, to uh, to gain energy and to save some propellant. But we need to ensure that juice arrives actually at, at the proper time, the right time and the right uh, velocity to meet uh, the Earth, um, as you can see here. Uh, and in fact, for this, we had to um, to use a main engine uh, in November uh, to, uh, and we used uh, more more than ten percent or around ten percent of the entire fuel reserve that, of the spacecraft to do this maneuver. Otherwise, as you can see in this uh, bit simplified animation, uh, in in yellow you have the trajectory that Juice would have had without this deep space maneuver. Uh, and in uh, in red, the one that actually uh, took place, and you you can see that uh, without this deep sp space maneuver, Juice would actually have missed uh, the Earth. Well, would have, have missed the Earth for uh, the coming uh, summer. Next slide, please. 
Yes, so we mentioned the fact that the cruise phase is a very long cruise phase, uh, as all uh, planetary in the outer uh, planetary mission in the outer solar system part. So we need to ensure regularly that actually the payload is is uh, still in good shape, and also to calibrate the instrument uh, in preparation also for the for the phase at Jupiter. So what you can see here on the left plot is, as a function of time, the distance of the spacecraft with respect to the Earth on one hand in blue and uh, in the, uh, with respect to Sun in, in orange. And you can see with the, with the stars that roughly twice a year, during a one-week period, we uh, switch on uh, all the instruments to make sure that, uh, that their performance are still, uh, are still uh, the, the expected one. But of course, we have some constraint during part of the of the cruise phase. So what you see in the orange background is actually the the, the region uh, in the solar system where we are very close to the sun, and where we have very strong thermal constraint, which prevents actually to depoint the spacecraft to change the attitude of the spacecraft. During this time, we use the Huygen antenna as a sun shield, and we need to ensure that the Huygen antenna is actually always pointing to the sun to um, to protect the spacecraft. So. All the, 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 let's say, some specific geometric calibration of the instrument and the remote sensing in particular will need to occur during those checkout outside of those thermally constrained region of the, of the solar system. Uh, we had started this year with uh, with the first checkout in January, so everything went uh, went great. Uh, there were also several software updates for the instrument, some of the instrument, and we are now preparing the second one that will take place uh, early July. Next slide, please. So in fact, right after the second checkout of the instrument, we will have what we already mentioned several times, the, the, the Lunar Earth Gravity Assist that will take place on the 19th and 20th of August, which is the first uh, ever attempt double gravity assist. Uh, and of course, the, 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 the navigation and, and the, the, yes, the operation of the spacecraft uh, are absolute top priority and should um, should be considered without uh, without any any doubt as the the highest priority. However, uh, the moon flyby in particular is also a great opportunity to perform science on one hand, but uh, even more importantly, very important calibration for some of the instrument. This is some kind of uh, a proxy for uh, having an idea of what we we will be doing. Um, when we will fly uh, fly by the moons of the Jupiter system later on. And uh, therefore, there were already some very uh, intense discussion uh, within the science working team uh, to uh, decide uh, how and, and, and which operation, science, science instrument operation should have priority. It was a very useful exercise for us and for the, the, the entire JUICE team to actually exercise a little bit the discussion, the negotiation process, the prioritization process. And this will be certainly very useful in preparation also for the JUICE, uh, for the Jupiter phase. Next slide. Yes, because we, we need to keep in mind that even if we have a very long cruise phase, our main focus should remain uh, to get prepared for the for the Jupiter phase, which is where the prime uh, Jupiter science will, uh, Jupiter science will take place. So one activity that we have started already, uh, some times ago, but we will, that will go, um, still go for, for the next uh, years is the development of a strategic science planning. I was mentioning before that for the lunar flyby, we started to, to discuss the operation in January, whereas the flyby will occur in August for the, during the, the Jupiter phase, we won't have the luxury of time. So, in other terms, we will have to, uh, to make sure that we can plan many very important events, scientific events, like several flybys of the moon or several paths close to, to Jupiter in a very short time. So we need to have already, let's say, to start already the planning uh, during the cruise phase. So <clears throat> what we are doing uh, with strategic planning, so in a nutshell, it's two activities going in parallel. On the, on the one hand, uh, we iterate with the, the experts from the different uh, science discipline of, of Jews to identify where during the tour their science objective can best be addressed. Uh, and based on this, we iterate, so it's a long iteration with the different disciplines to converge towards uh, what we call a trajectory segmentation, where we identify as a function of time which science uh, gets priority uh, over time. 
and we make sure when we derive this this uh, segmentation that actually uh, the let's say the, the the criteria to to assess the quality of a plan uh, is fulfilled for the different discipline and also of course is fulfilled from the, from a, um, a resources point of view like the, the 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 amount of data that we can send back or or the constraint for navigation and so on and so forth. For some specific, very detailed part of the of the of the tour, either the one for which we know that it's going to be very challenging, like uh, Olivier was mentioning, the Europa flyby, where all the payload will operate in parallel, and and actually it's kind of limited uh, time window, uh, or for uh, segments that are representative of something that can be reused several times on on uh, similar geometry conditions over the tour. We perform what, what we call a detailed scenario feasibility analysis. So for this one, we go in really into details with the science teams into developing the detailed pointing, developing all the resources at a very much um, higher level of detail that at segmentation level to ensure that actually uh, the assumption that we had made at high level are, are, are right. Next slide, please. And actually, one thing that gets the, the Science Operation Center and the instrument teams quite busy in the past months was to work on such a detailed planning scenario. So uh, we selected a time window of 100 of, uh, of hours centered around a closest approach to, to Jupiter, where we went into this exercise of developing the pointing in very details to identify which instrument should drive the attitude for each period of time and to make the analysis of the resources consumption for this, this plan to validate act actually the, the assumptions. So we just finished this exercise, I think it was uh, one month and a half ago. Next slide, please. Yeah, one point that is uh, extremely uh, interesting and that uh, is also uh, ongoing at the moment is the discussion with the Clipper team. So Clipper will uh, also, um, well, will be launched later this year and uh, will go to the Jupiter system. The focus of Clipper will, of course, to be uh, will of course be on on studying uh, the Moon Europa in great details. But it gives us a very, uh, very interesting uh, opportunity uh, to have multi-point measurements. So on one hand, uh, we will have this uh, opportunity to have those two-point measurements during cruise because the two, the two, uh, <clears throat> the two spacecraft will be uh, together uh, in the uh, in the outer solar system at the same time. So there will be. Uh, much opportunities to uh, to study some uh, specific heliospheric heliophysics um, uh, science. Uh, next slide, please. Yes, but the the most let's say the most relevant part, for, at least for from the juice point of view, is that the two uh, spacecraft should be together for a given for a large period of time in the in the Jupiter system. So here you can see an animation where Jupiter is at the center and where you can see the four Galilean moons uh, and the two spacecraft uh, with uh, their, their trajectory. Um, there, they will give absolutely stunning opportunities for uh, magnetospheric uh, physics, for instance, like having some uh, multipoint measurement, having a more temporal and spatial uh, complementarity, being able to have a local view while you have a more global view when, for example, uh, juice will be at higher latitude. There's also the opportunity to observe, uh, Olivier was showing the aurora earlier on, to observe the aurora while uh, the other spacecraft is performing in situ measurement close to the moon that, uh, that is interacting with, uh, uh, with the Jupiter um, magnetic field. Uh, and there will be, uh, I think we saw it uh, at a certain point, there will be also great opportunity for uh, moon science uh, they could provide the two the two spacecraft could provide, for instance, uh, more coverage in terms of uh, of surface coverage, in terms of true anomaly coverage, uh, to to assess a little bit more in detail the tides that uh, are taking place. And there's a great opportunity uh, happening uh, in July at the moment in July 2032, where the two spacecraft will be flying over Europa with a time separation of four hours. So this uh, can be a bit scary when you look at the animation, where you have the feeling that the two spacecraft are crashing one on the uh, on each other. But 
from a science point of view, it's going to be a great opportunity. So we have uh, we have the Juice Clipper Steering Committee, which is consist which consists of members of the two science teams that are actually working on this at the moment, uh, identifying what are the opportunities for synergistic science, uh, and that will come up with recommendation of how we can fit that uh, into the the, the Juice uh, the Juice uh, plan. Next slide, please. Yeah, I was mentioning in the, my first slide that there is also some decision being taken during this first year by the science working team. Here is one that uh, that is actually, well, two that were actually extremely relevant. Um, so we mentioned the perfect launch uh, of, uh, of JUICE last year, and it was so perfect that actually we saved significant amount of uh, propellant. And this uh, allowed uh, the, the teams to actually decide uh, to use part of this margin to uh, add a last part of the trajectory to, to remain in orbit around Ganymede, but go down to an altitude of 200 kilometers. So this is a very important part of the, of the mission and will provide uh, extremely interesting opportunities for um, ionospheric and, uh, and geophysics science in particular. Uh, and there's also um, some work, well, a lot of work being done to improve the, the, the current trajectory. Um, last, uh, at the end of last year, the mission analysis uh, suggested um, two, let's say, options to improve the trajectory. And the improvement can serve several uh, disciplines. So it can be either to uh, optimize the, 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 the latitude that we can reach by incl inclining the orbit of JUICE, while remaining very close, well, as close as possible from the planet, but also to improve the coverage of uh, of some of the surface, and in this case, to improve the coverage of Callisto. So those two options are now on the table, and the science working team will decide in May which one should become the the, the let's say the baseline to be studied in more details in the next year. Uh, okay, so I give the floor back to Olivia now for the for this one. Okay, okay. So thank you, Claire. We go quickly through the remaining slides to leave some time for, for questions. But here, very quickly, that we had also a discussion um, uh, between July last year and October to discuss whether we, will, uh, we would like to perform an asteroid flyby during the cruise phase. We got a lot of questions about that, including from the scientific community who are interested in the exploration of small bodies, of course. I think it's always interesting to uh, to explore uh, an asteroid during, uh, during the flyby. There was a potential target amongst many other targets, which was the, the asteroid 223 Rosa, which is a, bi uh, a big one. So we have done some uh, some studies to see what was possible to do, what would be the scientific return, what would be the technical challenges associated to that. And after many, many discussion around with the, with the science teams and the project, we decided not uh, to make any asteroid flyby during the cruise phase, mainly to keep uh, all the fuel margins um, for us, uh, just in case something goes wrong, or to improve the, the, the trajectory during the nominal mission and to improve the science return of juice. It was judged not a good idea to spend the fuel already uh, already during the cruise phase when after it, it's uh, too late if something goes wrong and, really, and there is no gas station en route uh, to refuel the spacecraft, as you know. So no asteroid flyby. Um, then very quickly to tell you that we in the background, we're also working to prepare the archive, even if it's still in the in the few years from now, but uh, we are working on the archive plan to see which data product we are going to release. And the first data will be released this year, in fact, from uh, from the commissioning phase, so the housekeeping data, uh, some of the images uh, from the monitoring camera, and hopefully some data from the radiation monitor. So stay tuned for the first uh, data release. We also prepare um, with all the science teams a collection of articles, so 22 reference articles that describe everything about JUICE. So hopefully it will be ready uh, beginning of next year. So stay tuned of that. So there will be uh, many, many pages uh, about all the aspects of JUICE, so science, engineering, design, trajectory, uh, and science. We also released uh, a few months ago the, the movie made by Martin, which will cause the, the making of juice. So you can find this on YouTube if you have not uh, watched it. And with this two hour movie, you can get an understanding on what has happened during the development phase or from the technical point of view, programmatic challenges, human 
So it's a very interesting uh, movie to, uh, to, uh, to, to say something about what, uh, what was behind the scene, uh, so to say. So I hope that with this uh, with this short talk we have uh, we have convinced you that even if it's a, a cruise phase, uh, we are far from an hibernation phase. So all the teams are very busy. We are uh, so the instrument teams, uh, the project team at ISOC and ISAC, also uh, also in the industry, uh, to make sure that uh, we prepare best what will happen in 2021. So we are very focused, and everything we'll do is really to be to be ready for this uh, for this phase. Uh, that will start sometimes in uh, 2031. So with this, uh, we will, uh, I think, stop and we are open to uh, to take some uh, some questions and thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Claire. Thank you so much, Olivier, for this wonderful talk and update about this most exciting mission, our first ESA mission to the outer solar system, uh, at least by our own. <laughs> Um, so yes, so the floor is open for questions. Please put your questions in the chat. And I see we already have one question, so I will uh, read it. So it's a question by Ronnie Mann. And Ronnie asks, on the Earth gravity assist this August, will it be possible to ob observe Jews from Israel? I assume he's based in Israel. And if yes, at what time and direction we would like to take a photo of Jews? Okay, so as we do for every planetary flybys, uh, we'll do that in the in the in the few weeks. We will put on the web all this information because we we got indeed a lot of requests from uh, amateur uh, astronomers and so on. We will show the we, we need to uh, to to compute the trajectory. So we will show the path of uh, juice as a function of time, in particular on the night side. So we are going to provide uh, all this information uh, ahead of time for for you to plan any uh, any observations with telescopes or so on. So yeah. Well, okay, great. And over, over Israel, I don't know if Claire you, you know already, but we can we can check later. <laughs> well uh one thing I just want to comment, I don't think so, but we can check. Uh what I can say on top of this is that uh, there is a juice website actually if you type juice cosmos on uh, on your browser you should be pointed toward this website, and on this one we have uh, we have a section which what which is called cruise reports, and where you can get uh, an overview of the um, of the footprint, let's say, of the spacecraft over Earth, uh, with an indication of the the illumination and of the um, the altitude. So this gives you already a preliminary, let's say, view of what the flyby will look like. Uh, now, from a very uh, quick look at it, I don't think it will be visible from Israel. But yeah, as, as Olivier was uh, was mentioning, I think we will go into more details in the coming uh, in the coming months. Uh, I guess it depends on how good your telescope is, because of course it will fly by the moon, and then it will take a day to get to past the Earth. So maybe maybe you can find juice. I don't know. Yeah, maybe there will be some. Be. I don't know what magnitude Jews will have in the sky. But <laughs> I know there were there were some pictures, right, of Jews leaving Earth, right? Yeah, yeah, they were they were yeah. published yeah, yeah, on the okay. on the on the web. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So people have powerful telescopes. Who knows? Uh, we have two more questions. Uh, we have the first uh, other question is by Sebastian Stuber, and he asks what uh, what is the data throughput from Jupiter to Earth? How much is pre -pro how much is pre-processed on the satellite, or is the raw uh, raw sensor data being transmitted? So the the rate uh, should be an, of a minimum of one one point four gigabits per day that can be sent, but it's going to be more than this using the baseline that we have used so far, and then the raw data are being transmitted, and then. Uh, I mean, the te the telemetry is being transmitted, and then the the, the raw data and the sense data are being derived um, at ES well in the Institute of the Instrument and at ESAC. Okay, okay. I hope that answers your question, Sebastian. Um, Jan Erik Walund he comments that uh, juice will pass over the Pacific just south of Alaska. So, hang on. The Pacific, oh, right, the Pacific, so in the Northern Hemisphere, yeah, the south of Alaska. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, there's more questions and comments. We have 
Paul Paul Vizi, um, who asks Clipper or Jews have uh, Clipper of, or Jews have bigger chance to find if any life, and or can they confirm each other measuring? Can they confirm? Can they can they confirm each other if somebody if one of the other finds finds life? I mean, we're not finding life, but indications of perhaps. Tricky question. Uh, yeah. no, you want to answer? Or shall I? Shall well, I, I would say that the simple answer is that we will not <laughs> detect life. So we are not we are not going there to detect life. So and we, I mean, the spacecraft is not equipped to detect any biosignatures or whatever. So, I mean, there's there should be, shouldn't be a confusion between habitability and uh, and and life uh, and looking for life actually. Yeah, we do step by step. So the first step is to explore uh, those moons to, to characterize the ocean. Uh, for example, at which depth do we have these oceans underneath the crust? How how wide are those oceans? If we can get information on their composition and on the the the, the full structure of the interior of the moon, which is important to to constrain for the habitability, the role of Jupiter, the role of the other moons, and Clipper will focus on Europa. And we will focus on the rest of the system, in particular Ganymede. So that will that will give us, I think, a global picture of the Jupiter system in terms of habitability. And then, if I'm sure there will be interesting findings, and from uh, those findings there will be new questions. I'm pretty sure related to life. And then uh, it will be up to uh, to the space agencies and the scientific communities to plan the next uh, missions to answer these these new questions. Exactly. I think with a bit of luck, we might fly through some, um, you know, a plume maybe coming out of Europa. Who knows? Okay, uh, another question. We have Mark Mark, Mark uh, Zavan, Sa, Safanyi. I hope I pronounced that correctly. He asks, thank you for this presentation. My question, what is the total distance Jews will travel from launch to the end of the mission? I think it was around six bill billions, no? Olivier, do you remember? Yeah, something like that. A few billions of of, of kilometers. In fact, uh, we should check, but we have a tool. Um, we should check if we can have this capability or if it's already there. Well, there is a tool called Where is Juice? And you can see the, the distance, I think, uh, traveled by the, the spacecraft. Um, in, in real time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you, you, on the, on the website, yes. Let me you check. can play with it, or if we if it's not, we'll 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 adapt it because I know it was there for for Rosetta. We have, so, but yeah, it's a few typically a few a few billions of 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 kilometers. Mm -hmm. We have it's Alessandro Atsai, and he says six billion kilometers. Alessandro was part of the Jews mission uh, at ESA. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, Jean Pierre Le Breton. He 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 says thank you. Great talks for. Great mission. Best wishes to mm -hmm. for the moon for the moon Earth double flyby. So, thank you, Jean Pierre. Uh, we have Pascal Renier who asked, "What about flying by a small asteroid for for less than ten meters per second? Like with if Delta V is a is a, like a a coin, right? Good yeah, for science, yeah, yeah, good yes, for yes, operation, yes, yes. good for public interest during the cruise. What about that? Yeah, yeah I know that uh, Pascal Small is Delta from v. Airbus, so he was he was ah, okay, always okay, okay. interested by uh, by this kind of uh, of operations. So uh, now we, we have been studying it, uh, maybe not in in a great amount of of details, to see what we can do. The the, the main reason for not doing an asteroid flyby was indeed related to the to the fuel. Uh, and also for the for the target, I mean, what can we achieve with different amount of fuel with respect to different target? And indeed, we we could maybe have find a small asteroid for a small amount of fuel, but we we thought it was not worth spending fuel for this. But also, it's not only fuel; it's also uh, resources, study analysis. So all in all, we we prefer to keep all our resources to uh, to update the the. Or the science return of juice when when it will be in the in the Jupiter system. But we have studied it, and I know Pascal was also behind that. So, um, but the decision was not not to do it. Okay. Another question by Cesar Grava: Are the uh, are there scientific investigations of the Moon planned for the coming flyby? 
Well, uh, yeah, maybe yeah, yeah, we can summarize. Uh, just what I, I, I can comment, uh, and I'm sure people like Yann Eric would like to comment on this as well. Um, the, the, the problem we have for the moon flyby is that we are really, really constrained in terms of operations. Of, uh, of spacecraft operations. So the, the highest priority for the payload operations around the moon flyby are really based on the, uh, the calibration needs. So the highest priority is for calibrating uh, the instrument, especially those that need those specific conditions to be calibrated during cruise. Now, since uh, a significant part of the payload will be operating around the closest approach, uh, for sure, there will be as a side product, let's say, uh, some science investigation being performed. But yeah, it was yeah, it sh it was not the the, the 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 main focus of the of the flyby. So I don't know, Olivier, if you want to to no, say. No, no, it's, okay, it's fine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, very good. Uh, Giuseppe Sari, uh, he just uh, comments or recomments on the distance traveled. It says uh, just to get to Jupiter, six point six billion. So. I guess, uh, then of course, in the Jupiter system. Anyway, the next question is by William McKinnon. Uh, I assume the answer is positive, but can you confirm the spacecraft's health at present, the status of the instruments, checkouts, etc.? Yeah, Claire, you can come on. Everything's going well. <laughs> Everything is going uh, really well. Uh, I mean, there are uh, some investigation on specific points, but uh, there is uh, nothing that... Uh, that uh, is related to a bad health of uh, of the instrument of uh, or uh, of the spacecraft. So so far so good. Excellent, excellent. Uh, we have a large large neighbor, uh, Naber. I don't know how to pronounce it properly, but he sends the link. And I, but I think uh, a link of where is Juice now. Yeah. So I think that I'm not sure that everyone can see the link though. But if there's a link in the chat, otherwise we can put it on the. Yeah. Put it but otherwise, if you type uh, "where is Juice Isa," you, you Isa, should be able to to find it right in the link. Yes, exactly. Well, more, more generally, all all the tools that uh, that are uh, relevant are in the Juice web. So mm. if you if you go into the Juice Cosmos Cosmos page, you will find yeah. this tool and others. Yes. Okay. Um, so there's no more questions here online. I had one about the open science, of course. Uh, the, 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 is there a priority period for, um, uh, for the, the data when it comes in for each instrument? Is there... Yeah, there is a, what is standard in planetary, in planetary mission is to have a proprietary period of six okay. months from the time that the, the the science team they receive the data on ground mm -hmm. to allow them to do their their sanity checks calibration and to uh, to find the initial findings um so that's usually this is the time six months after in practice it's between six months and one year because uh, it's always com complicated the data processing and you never know you can have some surprises or it's complicated to process all the data uh, injection into the database and so on but so uh, usually within a year yeah. the data will, will become uh, pu public we have the radiation monitor data which is more uh, uh, an engineering or facility instrument and here once the pipeline is in place the data will go uh, almost immediately into the public domain okay and also same for selection of housekeeping data engineering data uh, mm -hmm. the, Im the images from the monitoring camera, this, this kind of devices will go uh, quick, quicker into the public domain. And in terms of images, because everybody is happy, is uh, glad and uh, eager to get uh, images, we'll discuss with the with the camera, the camera team, but there is always some agreement to release some early images for public outreach. Uh, within the proprietary period, of course, it will be a... Uh, uh, not a good idea to keep the images for us and then to release a few months later. So there will be some images, of course, and data are released uh, before the proprietary period in accordance with the with the science teams. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Okay, um, so just, I guess, one more question for me. Will there be more selfies? Because we talk about images, but we have these cameras that can take selfies. selfies. Do we yep. do selfies uh, when we do flybys of Earth, Venus, and uh, Jupiter itself? Is that planned? Has that been has that been planned? Because these are really good as well for outreach. 
I think yeah. we're we, uh, selfies. I'm I'm not sure actually. Uh, we are looking Cameras. at it to, to 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 have a picture of the of the Earth with the monitoring camera. Mm -hmm. uh, but selfies, I don't think this is planned. I mean, the yeah, cameras we, we are on the spacecraft, right? And they're looking sort of at half at the spacecraft, half away. Oh, I mean, they see the part of yes, the spacecraft. Exactly. Right? Yeah, sorry, yeah, sorry. Of course, of course. Yeah, yeah. yeah but we are looking at opportunity uh, for actually operating the monitoring cameras. Right, which would be really good, actually. Yeah, yeah. Some point. yeah. They, they yeah. might, yeah, they yeah, might yeah. even, might even provide science. I mean, look, look, look what happened at Juno. Yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah. yeah. You never know. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, if there's no more, I see, I see no more questions coming in. I see people thanking, thanking the speakers, thanking the organization. Uh, thank you so much. I think we can. Uh, it is one hour now, so it's a good time to to wrap it up. Uh, again, thank you so much for uh, for being here, Claire Olivier, for your planet for hosting. Uh, I don't know, uh, Anita. Do you want to say a final word? Just, just thank you very much for ev to everybody for coming today. Um, and please do look out and hopefully we'll see you again at the next one. Yep. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Thank you and good luck at the flyby. <laughs> thank you very much.